Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to our uh, Plymouth Food Aid Network meeting of April, Thursday the 13th. Nice to see you all. Um, so we've got quite a packed agenda for the meeting today. Um, we've got a couple of guest speakers, which we're very lucky to have today. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Tammy Walker, who is the Training and Wellbeing Dementia Lead for Age UK. And then we're going to be hearing from Kai McConkey, who is um, from our uh, gambling services. So we'll hear it from them. Um, we may be joined later on um, from uh, Fair Share by Selly, uh, Shelley and Rachel. Not quite sure yet because they are doing uh, other things as we speak, so they may pop in. Um, then we'll do a bit of an update from you, the members, and Ian Smith for Plymouth will be doing a strategic update and then we'll have some time for discussions. So um, I'm going to launch straight into a hand over to you, if that's all right, Tammy. And okay. do you need to show your screen at all? No, not at all, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm Tammy and I work for Age UK Plymouth. I've been with them for 15 years now, and we've had quite a few changes in that time. But our current services at the moment, we have our free information and advice service which will help people with free benefit checks, form filling in, um, housing advice, advice on lots of different matters. Um, and they are a really useful service for people to know about that we're here. We have our help at home community support. They uh, help people with cleaning, laundry, shopping, companionship, sitting services, um, if someone needs to go on a on a social outing, they can accompany them as well. Uh, lots of different things involved in our uh, help at home. That is a paid for service, so there is a cost involved. Then we have our adult day centres. So we have our adult day centre, which is at Mount Gold, and that is for people that need um, companionship, support, uh, emotional needs physical needs and early onset dementia it's a really fun place to be they have lots of different activities and music and you name it they do it it's really fun place to be on a Tuesday they have a forget me nots group uh, which run uh, cognitive stimulation therapy sessions for I think it's 12 weeks and it's for people with early onset dementia who they're not really sure which day center may benefit them better. So they have that period of time to get to know them, for them to get to know us, and then choose which day center would be more appropriate for them. Uh, it's a, again, it's we just make it really fun. It's a it's a nice place, it's got a nice feel to it, and the staff are amazing. So uh, we then have our Dementia Day Centre at Plimstock, which is for people with mid to later stage dementias. And it's just fun all day. They play football, they do uh, cycling, they do word games, cooking, all sorts. So both day centres would be more than welcome for anyone to drop in and have a look. They'll show you around. Um, to see what we do. We offer a free taste today for people uh, to make sure that they can come along for a free day to see what they think and, uh, and take it from there. Lots of support on offer as well for the carers. And we have our wellbeing hub at Mount Gold, which is part of the wellbeing hub um, hubs around the city. So they offer everything that the, the other wellbeing hubs do. So activities, advice, social prescribing. We work in partnership with quite a few other organisations as well within that, uh, within that service. We have our hospital discharge team. They support people over 50 to, with support packages that are individually tailored for each person to help support them coming home and with any services that then they need to get in touch with, they can help with that. It's a really vital service and that's a free service as well. 
We have free home energy checks for people over 65 and they can provide free equipment as well, like draft excluders, uh, reflective radiator covers. They'll give tips on how to conserve energy and make, get the best out of all your energy gadgets at home. We have our gardening and handy person service. They will do obviously gardening and small jobs around the home. And then my role within the charity is I provide free dementia training in I can do a free one hour dementia friends information session, which is a really good introduction into what dementia is and why people have some of the behaviours that they develop. Um, and I do a six hour session, which is more in depth, goes into the symptoms of the dementias, how we can help, how it affects people. It's a really unique training. It's been developed with people who live with dementia and they feature in videos throughout the day explaining how their dementia affects them. So it is, it's a really worthwhile course. So if you know anybody that would benefit from that, they just need to get in touch with me. I run regular sessions at our Mount Gold Centre. It's all free. I can bring it out to organisations and run it for you as a group within your own setting. Um, and it's just a really good opportunity to learn a little bit more about what dementia is. I've been supporting people with dementia for about 28 years. So I've got lots of practical experience um, and lots of knowledge to share. So I, I'm really, really embracing this role. It's really, um, really interesting for me to meet lots of people and to pass on what I've learned over the years. So, uh, and I say it's all free. Tammy's got my email if, and I'm happy for you to share it with everybody, Tammy, if, uh, if that's appropriate. And uh, yeah, just get in touch and let people know what we're doing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks, Tammy. That's really helpful. Could you pop your email in the chat as well? Of course, yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Lindsay? I can. Uh, yeah, that was really, really interesting, Tammy. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the age elig eligibility. You mentioned a couple of ages in there and over 65s, over 50s. Particularly yeah. interested in the free and phone advice, the age eligibility there. Yeah, um, that's all for over 50s. The only, everything is over 50 apart from the free energy checks. And that's okay. because it's um, done through a funding grant. Okay, that, that, I'm... I'm I'm very happy about that because I was expecting you to say 60 um, and <laughs> certainly a lot of the people that we work with on the suit run, um, their, their apparent age is, is actually much older than their, their biological or whatever you say, than their, what their date of birth indicates and that yeah. they often need help uh, earlier in life than other citizens. So that's great to know. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions at all from anyone? Everybody will probably think of questions, right? <laughs> just as you've gone. <laughs> that, you can email me. That's My email's brilliant. there. Just send me an email if you've got any questions about anything. And I can obviously signpost you then to the, the departments that you'd be interested in. That's lovely. Thank you. Ah, oh, Richard's got a question. Okay, can I ask? Um, the Salt Ash Food Bank, so we, we support mostly Salt Ash, but we do cover a little bit of Plymouth as well. Are, yeah. you, are you territorially limited? We are for most things, yes. Yeah. Um, I have ventured into Salt Ash to do <laughs> training. <laughs> um, but apart from that, yes, most yeah. of it is is within the Plymouth boundaries. So, so, so if we had clients in um, the, the PL5 area, which we do support, we could direct them. Absolutely. To you, but not somebody from our side of the, the water. Yeah, yeah. They? No, Unfortunately. No, you, you need territory sometimes, but... Uh, Anyway, I'm yeah. glad, you, glad you got back out of Salt Ash Alive anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, well, if there's no other questions, thank you very much, Tammy. That's really been really interesting. Thank you for joining us. You are Thank welcome to stay, me. obviously, for as long as you oh. want to. Um, 
I'll, I'll leave you to it. But thank you very much for having me and uh, good luck with your day. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, <laughs> oh, Kai, we're going to hand over to you. Okay, just bear with me. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Uh, firstly, I'm going to um, I'm going to apologise for my throat and my voice. I'm a little bit croaky. I've been under the weather, so um, yeah, if I'm not very clear, uh, apologies for that. Um, so my name is Kai McConkey, um, and I am a community engagement lead for the southwest um, of England. So that's uh, Dorset, Devon, and Cornwall. I cover so I cover everything in in Plymouth, um, and I work for our gambling services. So. Um, I'll give you a little bit of information about myself, first of all. Um, before I took this role, which I've been in for about three months now, um, I worked for another charity that covered Dorset and, and Devon um, and basically run a support group for people suffering from gambling harm. So I've spoken to a lot of people who have lived the experience of gambling related harms. Um, and I myself, uh, for over 25 years on and off, um, was someone who was harmful gambling. So I've got lived experience myself and I know a lot of stories of other people's recovery. So I'm very open to talking about that. So if ever, anyone wants to contact me about my own lived experience or questions from my point of view, um, I'm more than happy to do that. My email is there and it is on a slide at the end as well. So that brings me to, to this role. Um, so I deliver the Bet You Can Help program, which is um, gambling related harms. Um, fundamentally, it's one hour um, session that is free for any local charity. Um, and it's basically giving more um, information around gambling harms, trying to get people engaging in conversations around gambling harms. So at the moment, there just isn't enough talk um, at all levels about gambling. So we want people to understand it more, be able to engage in conversations and then signpost on. So that's the reason for the sort of one hour training. We do do a level two uh, one day course, which um, which is obviously a day, it's more in depth, um, but fundamentally the one hour is free for everyone. Uh, our, um, the charity I work for, um, they're based in Bristol um, and they've been there sort of operating for over 30 years and um, with alcohol, drug, mental health support, prison uh, re resettlement and housing support. Um, but the gambling services is what where I work, and as I said, we cover the whole area. So um, we've got a project such as the Six to Ten project, um, which is named uh, Six to Ten because basically, uh, for every person who engages in harmful gambling, there's an estimated six to ten people who suffer gambling harms. So it's really important that we provide counselling, but it's not just for the person who's gambling. Um, having been there myself you're not always ready for help, but there are other people being affected. So it may be that um, if I was harmful gambling and I'd say, you know, I had a partner, they might be suffering, they might not have any money for, for food, say. Um, so it's it's along those lines. We support um, we support the, the, the sort of affected others as well. So there's counselling for them. There's a lot of advice and help and, you know, it can help them to understand things and their support for them and also they may be able to further engage in conversations with the person who's harmful gambling um, if they understand it better so that's really important so yeah we, we provide uh, free and confidential structured treatment and counselling there's lots of good information on the website so even if people aren't ready for kind of treatment or counselling there is information on the website which may help and then can look at a further point There's loads of facts and figures there, um, which I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, I will just quickly run for a couple because it's always interesting. 42% uh, of people aged 16 plus gambled in the last month and 25% in the last week. Uh, does anyone have any idea of what the biggest um, form of gambling in the UK is? Anyone get any idea? Most participated in? Grand National? Horse racing is quite low. It's actually the reason that figure, but Grand National is massive as this individual event. It's one of the biggest. But the reason the figure is so high for monthly and weekly is because of the National Lottery, which a lot of people don't actually deem as, as gambling. Um, so that's why it's 42% is, is really high, but it's it's that high because of the National Lottery. Um, 
and I always find it amusing. There's now, I don't know, is there four or five different lotteries uh, or national lotteries and they seem to be every day. So if you're doing every draw and you're buying one ticket, you're probably spending 15 or 20 pounds a week on it. Um, but we still like to tell everyone when once one's won 10 pounds, they'll always say, oh, my numbers came up, I won 10 pounds. But no one ever says it cost me 20 pounds that week to, to win that. Um, so uh, 340,000 people were identified as problem gamblers with 1.8 more million at risk. Um, we are probably low. I've seen a lot of other statistics. Uh, 2019, the Gambling Commission, generally it's estimated that there's far more than that, um, which leads on to 10,000 people accessing treatment services in 2020, 2021. That's 3% of people estimated to suffer harm. So there's 97% of people out there that aren't getting help. Now, not everyone might want help, but I'm sure an awful number of those do. Um, so that's why we need to engage in conversations, get better understanding, and hopefully get some of those people that want treatment to be aware that there is lots of help out there. Um, and also, the, I can't quite read it, I want, uh, harmful gambling increases the risk of suicide by 15 times. So um, I think the sort of the estimates are in the UK, one to two people a day lose their lives to gambling related harms which is massive and um, it's really hard to kind of correlate that because a coroner doesn't put it on the death certificate there's a chance that it's even higher than that so um yeah we really want to do something about that excuse me so the national gambling support network um the thing to bear in mind there is there is lots of help out there um we are the service for the southwest but we work with other agencies that deliver different things so if someone needs a different type of support we can then refer on to them um one thing i'll say from today if you're going to take anything away from today please do be aware that there is a national gambling helpline and um, it's 24-hour support so for someone who needs help they've lost a lot of money they've lost their wages they can't feed themselves for the month and it's three o'clock in the morning, they've got no one to talk to, there's always the National Gambling Helpline. Um, they refer on to us, so we we can then, you know, if someone wants counselling, they will refer on to us, if so in the Plymouth area or, or Cornwall, um, the National Gambling Helpline will refer on to us. Um, if someone, if you did engage in a conversation with someone around gambling, and they said they just wanted counselling, give them the National Gambling Helpline, but get them to contact us directly, it's just one step quicker. To getting help if they can take side direct direct for counselling um quickly run through so there's lots of education and outreach programs young people uh, women's programs i can let anyone know further information about that uh gordon moody are a, a rehab center um which we work closely with if someone needs that type of treatment we would um refer them on to gordon moody um an epic restart foundation that is a sort of a, a recovery uh sort of support uh, program and we're ARA and lots of other places are working on relapse prevention um, so we're going to make sure that people who get their counselling then have other things to fill the time that gambling took on so there's lots of good work going on there as well because six, the first six to 12 months people it's a really high relapse rate so we're trying to prevent that as well um, I'm not going to go through all this slide this would be something I'll talk in more depth um, on the one hour the main thing to take away here is that there are no waiting lists. Um, having been there myself, um, needing help, um, I've had to wait months and months for certain services. Um, with ARA, the time is around about two weeks or less than two weeks. Uh, it depends sometimes on the availability of the client, but people can get seen really quickly. So if they contact us directly, they can be speaking to a counsellor within a couple of weeks. And that is really key because sometimes you only have a small window where you're wanting help and if that window goes sometimes you're lost back into gambling so um yeah that's really important um there's all the referral details there's my details there um so please do take note of that um said i've got lived experience of gambling um so please do contact me email me any questions you've got i'm happy to answer anything now or anything by email um and do Please engage in gambling to talk if, if you know in your personal lives or you know in your work lives because not enough people talk about it it is a hidden addiction um, and it tends to come out too late when people are really harmful gambling if we can get people talking get more understanding and get the help that's needed we can reduce the harms and get people that need the help the help that's needed 
Uh, any questions? Thanks, Kai. That's really, really helpful. Very interesting. Very, um, those statistics are really quite shocking, actually. Um, and I think I could speak for all of us. We're probably all a bit speechless at that. Um, yeah. yeah. Any questions at all from anybody? Lindsay? I, sorry, to, sorry to be always chipping in, but uh, that was really interesting, Kai. Thank you. I, we hear lots and lots about alcohol and drug addictions, and we hear very little about gambling addiction. But certainly as, as a volunteer with people who are affected by homelessness, I've come across it. Um, and it, it's really vicious. It's, it's a really difficult situation to be in and little understood. Um, something that really struck me from what you said was the need to fill in the time that the addiction took up. That is rarely acknowledged by people working on addictions. Um, and ha having volunteered in a hostel where a lot of people have drug and alcohol addictions and seeing the benefits of occupational therapy, where you give people something to do, something meaningful to do, it, it's incredibly powerful. So, I mean, thank you for acknowledging that. Yeah, that, that's a really good insight. It's, um, it's so true. Um, I mean, I think all addiction, it takes up so much of your time. I mean, I can tell you from a gambling point of view that when you're participating in it, you lose time. So it takes up a massive amount of time when you're actually doing it. When you're not doing it, you're thinking about it. So you're not engaging with other people. Um, and even, you know, there's times like, you know, there's streaming services and things where people can watch people gamble. And when you're so stuck in the cycle, it's almost 24 seven. It can take over just everything. If you take away something that's taken over your life, you you need to fill that time. Otherwise, you will just slip back into it. So that's what we're working on. There's lots of different projects going on, um, and lots of good you know good good, good partnerships that we're forming with other agencies. Um, so yeah, that that's sort of in place. And to give people purpose as well, you know, volunteering things like that, other stuff that doesn't necessarily cost money, but things that can fill the time. Thank you. Are you happy to send those details, especially that slide, and we can circulate that to the network? I know we did put the recovery for all link and the bet you can help link um, in the original one, but it'd be good to you know, do a bit more with your contact details as well. Yeah, absolutely. I can get those all to you. And uh, yeah, like I say, please do contact me with any questions, any thoughts afterwards. Um, and yeah, there's there's details there are sort of how to refer onwards or people can just refer themselves or with consent you can refer for other people but um you know if anyone has any need for the the hour training please do contact me as well um it's really useful and it's it's an hour of your time but it it gives so much insight beyond even working life it's it's i've spoken to people in person and they're like well actually i know someone who i think might be you know a problem gambler i mean everyone in this room will know someone who is either at risk or has problem gambled in their life there's probably no doubt about that but it could be something that we could look at doing as a network so maybe that we um if you're happy to come and do an hour's training then we can invite members from the network to come along rather than everybody doing individual ones if we give everybody enough notice um does yeah. would anyone be interested in that yeah, I mean, it would expand on that, and you know, everyone here who's you know who's seen this, if they you know questions as well, you know, we can go into a bit more detail. I like to make it a bit more interactive. The hour, um, excuse me, um, that would be yeah, that'd be great. I can be in contact afterwards, um, and we can set something up. Fantastic. And would you do that online, or would that be face to face? Um, I could do either. Um, it would be whatever's easiest for people. I mean, obviously, if it was in person, I'd need a location to do it. I'm happy to. I mean, I quite like, I like in person, it's, it, but this is easy for everyone, um, but it's just whatever everyone wanted, I can do. I'm wondering on that one if, uh, and it's a brilliant offer that, and it's a great idea to come. Uh, I'm wondering, Tammy and, and Co, if we think about that, maybe we could do it a blended one using the Meeting Owl device that some people could be in the room and others could join online. Uh, and we could also, I think we should then be able to record it as well, shouldn't we? So it will be your resource then, uh, if, if you're okay having it recorded. I don't know, sometimes you can sometimes you can't but I think that's a conversation to have isn't it I think 
Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy for it to be recorded. I um, mean, you know, I'm very open. I don't mind, um, you know, I'll, I'll go on radio shows and podcasts and talk about, you know, my my story. So I'm, I'm very open to things being recorded. It's just you know, the more that it's spoken about, the better and the more people we can reach. Yes, yeah, it's, it's great. So that'd be, that'd be amazing. Marvellous. Thank you. Richard. Uh, thank you. I know it, it's more a comment. Just of late, I've noticed quite a lot of TV ads on some of the streaming sort of channels like ITV4 and so on, either for postcode lottery, which is a kind of also cheap tracking and swinging through the door uh, as well. Um, and also some of the some of the gambling services. And there was a little line at the bottom saying gamble safely, stop with it. You know, it's a bit like having cigarettes may harm your health on the packet, isn't it? You know. It, yeah. It, 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 is advertising of gambling and its options starting from the softer versions like the lottery and most lottery a real problem do you think in getting people drawn in to the web it is yeah i mean if you look at where gambling is it's behind sort of alcohol and tobacco so you can remember like uh, most grand prix racing snooker uh, it was all alcohol and, and tobacco um and you know benson and hedges or whatever it was 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 everywhere um and now it's um you know, now it's, it's you, they've, they've sort of got rid of that, but it's all gambling. So it's sort of kind of alcohol and, and drugs, addictive kind of things. Now it's replaced with an, another one. I'm sure it will change. It is changing, um, mm -hmm. but probably like those, it's quite slow in because the revenue it brings in. I know the government are looking at lots of stuff, but the, the revenue it does bring in, um, it's a you know multi-billion pound industry. So it, yeah, I mean, there was a. a something done where they watched a football match um, and it was a ridiculous amount of times that gambling, gambling advertising was shown because it's on every football shirt, it's on the banners around it. It was it was thousands and thousands and thousands of gambling images. So it is a problem. Um, it is slowly changing. So they're trying to sort of stop getting celebrities of certain celebrities involved with it. But um, it, yeah, it's, it's like anything, it moves quite slowly. Thanks, Kai. Um, would you be able to stop sharing your screen and then we I can will. see you? <laughs> well, that worked all well. <laughs> it did, well done. <laughs> Quite friendly Zoom sometimes. Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. And then you have anything, if you want to send me anything, we can send that round when we send the recording round to the network. So I'll, I'll be in contact afterwards. And... Well, thank Thanks you for, for listening, listening, everyone. Coming. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. So what we'll do now is we'll just um, go around and just have a bit of an update from you all, if that's okay. And you, know, you just want to introduce yourself as to where you're from as well, because a couple of people watching it don't know everybody. Um, that one, I did get a bit of feedback. Um, and then we'll follow on with Ian after that with some updates. So um, I'll go where my screen is. I'm going to start with you, Eve, if that's all right. Good morning, I'm Eve. I'm at Four Greens Community Hub in Whitley. Sorry, I've got a bit of a throat, throat thing going on. Um, no change here as such. There are lots of things about to happen, I think, but food bank, um, community larger, lots of social groups going on. Um, Yep, beyond that, not much that I can relay to you. I can't even ask Mark this week. So, um, yeah, maybe more in the future. Thanks, Eve, and hope you feel better soon. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm the co-op food organiser for Plymouth. Um, updates. So we have our first um, co-op food club starting in Manadon at the Manadon Sports Centre and that starts at the end of April and then we have our other co-op food club trial starting in Southway and that starts in May uh, and that's starting at the Southway Youth and Community Centre and then after that we've got our uh, co-op food trials where uh, like 20 people come together to share food um, and we've got them starting in a school Mayflower school so yeah it's um it's all starting to happen it's it's really good and the lights have gone off because they do constantly <laughs> yeah. so yeah those are the updates 
Kelly, are you able to say a little bit more about what the food club is at Manadon and South Bay? Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, at Manadon and South Bay, they will be uh, open to everyone in the local area they're going to start with. So at Manadon Sports Hub, we are working with the Argyle Community Trust um, and they are going to uh, put the offer out to everybody that uses a trust in any way, family that they're currently working with and they would pay £3.50 for 12 items when they come here. They are getting food from Fair Share but they're also getting food from, from other ways. They have other suppliers obviously that they work with and they're doing their food drives um, at the big matches so they've just done one recently and they're using that food um, to help with the larder. So yeah, it's 12 items for £3.50. It'll be exactly the same format at Southway. And we will just be able to, with all the money that is made from people paying in, use it again to buy food. So that all the money that's generated goes back into food. That's the way that we're doing our food clubs. So that's the way that they are working. Uh, they are not for profit. Like I said, everything goes back into food. We've been able to come up with different things that we're using. So we've got um, terms and conditions that we're using to say, if you sign up to this one, this is the only one that you would sign up to within the local area. So you would sign up to one food club and use this food club uh, and just other bits and pieces in there. So yeah, it's, um, it's going well. So if any of um, anybody watching the video would be interested from a provider's point of view of you know, potentially uh, starting their own food club, they can make contact with us and we can put them directly in contact with you. Yeah, definitely. That'd be really good. We are we're working with lots of people currently and trying to, um, it's the change of the model from it being free or however it currently is to then um, getting people ready to move it over to be able to pay. And it is a small amount. It's a nominal fee, um, but it does help. It is able to pay the money in most circumstances. We're able to pay for fair share and then we're able to pay for some additional food afterwards as well. That's brilliant. Thanks, Kelly. And they get on, um, ongoing support from you as well. Yes, yeah, they do. So I'll help with all of the things that you need for setup. We've got all of the templates that you can use. We've got posters, flyers, everything for you to be able to edit. We've also got uh, food club membership cards. So there's there's lots of things. You get all the terms and conditions, everything that's already been gone through. We can take you through legal checks as well if you haven't done it before. So just refrigeration temperature checks, those kind of things that people need to know. Um, most people are already doing those things anyway but if you're starting from scratch there are some things that uh, we will go through with you and then yeah once you're up and running just contact me if you need any help I will pop in and see how you're getting on that's it that's great thanks Kelly uh, Richard could we come to you <laughs> when I find, find my unmute button yes um, for so much. I'm pleased to see Rika seems to have appeared in the corner, so I'll pass on to her in a minute because she, she is much more hands on at the front end. Um, hi, Rika. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, the impression we're getting is that we're still very busy. Um, I think we had our busy, Rika knows you got numbers, our busiest week the other week um, for, for a long time. And the need is still very much there. Um, and we're also trying to work quite positively with our um, other local organizations like the um, PL12 <coughs> group and the community kitchen and so on. We, we, we're very limp, we, we, we're strictly a food bank, um, but plus some energy and um, winter support. Um, but we do try and work out with other organisations who do the, <coughs> can provide the, the social contact and care that we can't. Um, so yeah, no sign of it. No sign of the no sign of the issues abating. I'm afraid. <laughs> But we have managed to contract a few new volunteers who are coming in and coming on stream. And um, there's you know, a lot of goodwill and people wanting to support and help. But the need is, I mean, I'm sure everybody would agree, is, is just not diminishing at all. Rika, I could, while we're on the salt ash, do you want to pop in there with your hands on experience? Yeah, it's sort of, uh, yeah, last month we had sort of nearly double the figures that we had at uh, sort of same time last year. So we had. Definitely, it was a significant increase. 
the number of people that we needed support. Um, one of the questions that came up yesterday from, from one family was that some areas were having support through holidays for families that also have free school wheels and other areas were not. I don't know if that's similar in Plymouth at all. Does anybody can tell me at all? We've got Fit and Fed running through the holidays, um, mainly the uh, uh, the summer holidays but it was during so that's clubs where children will go and they'll get free school meals um as for Cornwall I don't know what's happening over there I'm afraid there wasn't much supporting sort of salt tax but then I heard they were, they were issuing vouchers to families in Callington so which is just not not that far away from us so it just found, found it sort of quite strange and that might be why we had so many people come to us last month just at the start of the holidays when they sort of realized that they didn't have um, the sort of money to spend on, for, for help with, with children's meals. Um, just, a, just a thought that I had. Um, but I say we, we're starting to having to buy in stock, which we haven't had to before. Um, just, usually you have to have surplus uh, that we managed to share with other organisations. But so recently we had to buy in um, items. So which I hope is not going to be the norm uh, for us. Um, We'll make some inquiries for you. Um, we can get in touch with Cornwall Council and we'll get back to you with that. Sorry, we can't hear you really. Up, but we'd like to know what support there will be sort of in future holidays as well with the summer holidays coming up and things like that. So what support there will be. Yeah, yeah we've, like we've got contacts with, um, with Matt Sharp with Cornwall Council who would probably be deeply involved in this as well. Also, interestingly enough, the Cornwall as a county has recently come into the full on come into the whole sustainable food places fold as well uh, with Matthew Thompson and, uh, and co. They've done a whole lot of work down further west, down in Red Ruth, Camborne and so on in the past. So that's another avenue we can explore as well with Matthew. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I'll, well, I think a good thing to do would be actually have a proper conversation with him about yourselves, because there's a few of you on the South East Cornwall that, that link into, into this network, which is great. And there's a few round into West Devon and across into the South Ams as well, around the edge of Plymouth that join in. So, so yeah, I think that's one Tammy and I can follow up on. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Ian. I mean, quite often the sort of the Cornwall, Cornish initiatives seem to happen down to Central and West and we get a bit sort of uh, <laughs> left out of it. I think they just assume we're going to get support from across the river. So, um, yeah, it would be good if you, anything you can sound, you set, find out for us would be helpful. Thanks. No problem. Uh, Lindsay, could we come to you? Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, uh, as you know, Tammy, um, we produce a monthly report, which we circulate to you, but I'll just pick out a few highlights from that, if I may. Um, so, Plymouth Soup Room is where I'm from. Um, we served 2,474 meals in March, average about 80 a night, uh, but that skews during the week from you know, 30, 40 on rare occasions to 130 odd, on, on, often on a Sunday night. Um, it's about 11% up on this time last year. So if you look on the big picture, we're, we run a typically 6% increase per year, but it's starting to creep up, which is a bit concerning. Um, one good thing that uh, happened uh, finishing in March, we, we had some support from the Household Support Fund from Plymouth City Council at £2,500, and we, we used that to buy goods to help people keep warm. And an interesting thing we found was that a lot of our clients are in accommodation where the energy is part of the rent. And so they they weren't struggling too much this winter, but this is going to catch up with us because landlords will suddenly discover that the rent is not covering the energy that they're providing. So there's a little bit of a time bomb ticking away there. And uh, we've talked to Path Plymouth Access to Housing about this because um, they're having similar experiences with their clients. Um, but anyway, we were able to support 118 people through the grant um, with slow cookers, kettles, warm clothing, blankets, sleeping bags. Um, and that, that was really nice. 294 items altogether we managed to buy with that amount of money. And that included, it might seem a bit strange, but it included um, 
about 70 bags for life because when you give people goods at the side of the road when they come to collect food on the, on the street they can't carry a kettle home or, or whatever so everybody pretty much got a bag for life with their um with the donation we made to them um big health emphasis we've had volunteer podiatrists work with us twice during the month and that's a typical pattern now um we we are able now to do very it's very tight but we can do emergency referrals to the dental school and everybody knows in Plymouth how hard it is to get a dentist so if you're street homeless and you're you're in pain your, your chances are, are very low of getting treatment so we can do a very small number of referrals and we've had the mass vaccination team working with us too uh, providing covid and flu vaccinations so um, i don't know tell me if you share our reports with the network um we don't at the moment they get okay. back to plymouth city council yeah i mean the thing to do um is that we we do post them on our, our website so if people are interested in having the details they can look at our um i think it's a newsletter tab on our website thanks yeah, perhaps we can send that link out with the follow up, Tammy, that would be good. So people do see it. I see your, your Twitter feed is very informative um, about what's gone on each night. So, um, yeah, it'd be good for people to tune into that, I think. Yeah, and we, we put something because of the, the character limitation on Twitter, we can only say so much. But on Facebook, we put a fair bit more information. That's great. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Emma, could we come to you? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Emma from the Independent Food Aid Network. I've been here before. I'm a little bit of an intruder in this group, I think, but um, as, as always, good to hear what's happening in Plymouth because we do a lot of work there. Um, just a brief update, I suppose, is that when we recently updated the Plymouth Worrying About Money leaflet, um, there's been loads of uptake for that, which is great, and um, we do always need to Thank you, uh, the council, for the funding for the printing of the leaflet and the distribution, so that it's easy, easy for us to do. Um, we also have a money counts training, or actually two sessions coming up for Plymouth. I'll pop in the link in the chat for you if you've not heard about it before. It's training. Um, that goes hand in hand with the leaflet, it enables you to see the leaflet as a tool to start conversations about money worries uh, with people who might be struggling. So it's aimed towards volunteers um, and, and generally anyone who comes across people who might be struggling financially with, with food or, or anything for that matter. Um, so yeah, have a look at that, that event bright link, sign up. There's still a few places um, left I think and because the uptake has been so high we are looking into potentially having more sessions as well but we're running the two for now and then seeing how we get on. That's brilliant thanks Emma. I think you'll get a lot more uptake now you've just said that. <laughs> Probably <laughs> we'll be sold out again. <laughs> a good problem to have. <laughs> um, Diane we come to you. Hi, I'm Diane. I'm from the Village Hub. We're based up in Stoke Village. Um, with regards to the food larder, sort of nothing's majorly changed there. We're still looking to get in, change it to a membership and um, charging for a certain amount of items. It's useful, Kelly, hearing you charge 350 for 12 we're just sort of working out sort of prices at the moment um our other exciting news is we've got lottery funding so that's for four years so we can keep our doors open for longer um, we're advertising for a good food person it was carmen and jess doing that role but that was under other funding so that funding stops now we've got new funding so we're looking sort of for a food person so which you've shared tammy thank you um that i think the closing dates in a couple of weeks time so if anyone knows anyone interested then yeah get in touch that's about us really just second, have you, you you kindly said you would link in with the um volunteer coordinator network yeah Dan. has anything progressed on that you might want yeah to no, I, i've heard from him but there isn't any dates at the moment but yeah we've been in touch yeah so definitely i'm in touch with him Brilliant. No, thank you for yeah. doing that. That's that's, that's right. really helpful on behalf of the network. So yeah. I would say to, to Tammy on the way in that maybe as and when you're underway on that, we'll make a slot for you, you know, to do that volunteer coordinator yeah. piece, you know, in these meetings, if you're happy with that. Yeah, definitely. That'd be good. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. 
That's great. Thanks, Diane. Um, Ella, did you want to say anything? I don't want to forget you there, sat next to Ian. I don't think I've got anything to add. Everything you're saying is really interesting and actually quite worrying that the take up for the for the food aid uh, is increasing. Um, uh, yeah, uh, shocking. Um, what I wanted to say is that uh, actually as a DBI, Diversity Business Incubator, we run a project, it's called uh, Our Devon Port. It's a network and it's based, uh, the idea is that we want to reduce poverty um, in the Devon, Devon Port and um, Stonehouse area. And as part of that, we went to visit uh, a food club, uh, which is in Devonport Library. Uh, yeah. It's only open once a, uh, once a week mm -hmm. and only for a couple of hours because the uptake is so high, people are queuing before before they actually open. They charge one pound for five items and two pounds for ten items, and that's the maximum you can take. Um, but uh, yes, it's it's very successful, um, and um, I think we all know that uh, people people feel so much better when they actually pay for something. Um, so yeah. Um, um, and I'm in Manadon, so I'm I'm looking forward to to trying the the co-op food club. <laughs> I'll be coming. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Thanks, Ella. Um, well, that's brilliant to have all your updates. Um, Ian, could we hand over to you for an update now? Yeah, I'll, I'll do the fair share piece at the end then. I think on that because I'll follow on from what Ella's just very hopefully set up and Kelly set up earlier, really. Um, so, um, you know, you've known that for many months now, we've been talking about the uh, Food Alliance and the, and the network that goes with that for this this network to morph into in the in the coming year or so. Um, so um, that is really starting to accelerate now. I've, I've done a whole bunch of costings for Rachel Silcock um, to, to look at actually implementing that and getting it going. Um, so I mean, what that's going to involve is very much a cash first approach that we've been talking about and Emma's just touched on again. And it's brilliant with this training and having got the leaflet um, refreshed and everything that goes with that. So that is so important uh, to, to keep pushing that side of it. Um, we, we spotted as well that some settings maybe could have been charging for things and we're giving them away. Um, and uh, yeah, for other services, they provide to other other services and other agencies. Um, so I think it's a, that's a situation if something you can charge for um, to try and get some money for that to support the great work that you're doing. Um, and basically, it's it's moving across more towards what what Kelly was talking about. It's brilliant that Kelly is actually live testing uh, some of this work beyond her original brief around the you know, around actually moving beyond the, the small scale of food buying co-ops into the affordable food clubs and social supermarkets as well, um, because there's nothing like doing it for real to test. But what Ella was talking about is one of the forerunners of that, which was, you know, set up some while ago at St. Albans there and Devonport Library, which is run by people from the church there, uh, or churches, um, and is a brilliant, brilliant model and has done really excellent work. So, you know, I think we're building on a body of work here. And I know a lot of you, uh, both on the call and those watching on Catch Up, um, are already moving in those directions. You know, you've diversified off into doing warm hubs. You've, um, you've tried to do things where you actually bring some money in, and that's so important for the ongoing situation. And we are still facing the situation of re genuinely rising demand as well. So uh, it is it is quite a thing to be involved in. Um, so, I mean, that is all moving forward. I, I've, I ran through it with you last time what it was about, but a lot of it is an access portal and a referral system and wraparound services. And we've heard a lot about that. Some excellent speakers today, that was tremendous. Um, and it's this pathways, getting people on pathways to better places rather than being stuck in a dependency cycle. Um, and obviously quality and best practices is vital in that, hence the work around volunteers and volunteer support, which you raised a few months ago, you know, it's, and Diane's helpfully taken up uh, on behalf of us all there on that. 
Um, and obviously, the whole thing is about financial su sustainability at the, end, at the end of the day. Um, so that is uh, going to be pursuing at some speed. Rachel is really keen. Rachel Silcock, this is, is who would have liked to be here today, but sadly has got a, another meeting she had to go to. Um, is really keen for it to develop. Uh, what we need is a few of you coming forward, either from this, you know, either on the call or those watching on Catch Up, um, to work as part of a group to take that forward. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, please uh, let us know and uh, and we'll form a group and we'll actually go about pursuing that and then feedback to everyone accordingly. Um, so so that's the big news on that front. So yeah, away we go really on that. Um, the, the another big thing that's happening that, that you need to know about, and again, it's looking for engagement from you, is that um, almost like a parallel piece to what I've just talked about is there's been a long time there's been an aspiration to do really large scale bulk buying uh, of food to save you having to go to retail outlets and everything that that involves. Um, and also, it's that's quite a thing to make work, and it's quite a thing to make work efficiently and at um, you know within a budget. But anyway, that is being pursued very vigorously. Mark Rolls um, sort of took a lead out of Walgreens on that, um, and there's a whole bunch of us have come together, uh, including um, a Devon Cornwall Food Action, Shelley and Co from Fair Share are involved in that. Um, Carl comes along from you know what was the the Ark as in its previous days. Um, we've got John Williams from Transforming Plymouth together. Uh, Kelly, um, Tammy and myself are on that group as well. So, uh, and, and lots of others. So it would be great, again, if some of you wanted to come forward, if that's something that's of interest to you, uh, to become part of that. that. That group is calling for a couple of representatives from frontline organisations um, to, to actually come forward and, and take part in those meetings. Um, so again, if any of you on the call or on catch up are interested in that, please uh, let us know and we'll feed that forward into that group. Um, so it's really an exciting development and yeah, it's, 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 it's huge. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll keep you posted on that. Um, I think other than that, uh, I did want to flag up to you um, that there is that part of the whole resilience package is that there's a collaboratory that does food growing and making the most of green spaces and all that side of things, um, which is called um, which is called Growing with Nature. Um, and we have got an event with Growing with Nature coming up, Food Plymouth a partner in that, as you'd imagine. Uh, and we've got uh, an event on the 22nd of April, it's a Saturday during the afternoon at the Market Hall in Devonport. Um, and I'll try and get some info to feed forward for you on that. But if you're interested in that growing side of things, um, that would be an interesting thing for you to drop in on. Um, and that involves Green Minds from Plymouth City Council, Food Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Octopus Project, and also the data place as well for the mapping on that. So, and loads and loads of community and voluntary groups. Uh, on which subject I've put in an expression of interest for um, the King's Coronation event, so celebrating volunteering on Saturday, the 6th of May down on the Barbican. Um, so again, if any of you would like to join in, so that's a Food Plymouth one for lots of different things that Food Plymouth does involving volunteers. Obviously you as a network are massive on volunteering. Uh, so if you'd like to take part in that with us, then please let me know, we'll put some collaboration together. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll go, go from there, I think, is what we will do. Um, and finally, uh, we've been working for some while now with the uh, Devon response, and this is throughout the pandemic, and then it's a cost of living um, around food insecurity. Um, and there's, there's some work coming up on research into the experiences of uh, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic uh, people and communities experiencing food aid. We're going to put a, a questionnaire out uh, to um, PFAN members. If those of you who are frontline providers would be kind enough to respond to that, um, that would be exceptionally helpful. And then there's other work to do behind the scenes on that as well. So I'll keep you posted on where that goes. Well, I'll stop there. Is that okay? Thank you. Oh, Shelley. Shelley. No, I must do the Shelley thing. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, the, the update from Shelley and Rachel is that they've 
actually, let me read it verbatim. Um, so this is a message from Shelley Wright at Fair Share. Um, Rachel Connett, our volunteer coordinator based in the warehouse at Plymouth up at Est over there, has accepted a new role supporting Shelley as charity account manager for Devon and Cornwall, um, which Shelley's delighted about. Uh, we will be soon making introductions and arranging dates for Rachel to visit your project and catch up on how everything is going with your membership. So if you're a fair share member, um, you'll be um, receiving a call and getting a visit. Um, and they're recruiting a replacement for Rachel as volunteer coordinator. They're shortlisting for that today. Um, so a really huge news that. So um, just, just so that you're all aware of that and uh, can respond. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. That's really helpful. Has anyone got any questions at all for Ian? No. Nope. If anyone thinks of anything, please feel free to contact Ian or myself. Um, well, that's led us very nicely to 11 o'clock on the dot. I don't think we've ever done that so um, well. So I'll stop the recording and thank everybody for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing you all in May and we'll send the new date out very soon.